And uh, we've been in there several months, and we'll be in there several more months. There's, I think, 28 chapters, and it'll take us a while to get through. The church has a blueprint, and it's written in Acts. Our churches worldwide have changed and strayed so much from the original intent that God had for church that it's just amazing. Now, some of the, some of the churches or buildings and places we would walk into wouldn't even resemble the church today. It's the true evangelism at its best. And I, I was so excited to go through Acts because uh, we're, we're a fairly new church, even though we're four uh, years plus uh, old, we're still young. But what is going on here is just amazing how we're growing and the new visitors we're getting weekly. It's just amazing. And I wanted us to go through the book of Acts, number one, to refresh our minds what the, the church is supposed to be. And number two, to keep in our hearts and our minds as we read and study what the church is supposed to be doing. If destiny, family, and faith is not on the map, we need to get on it quick. So it's, it's to refresh us and renew us and maybe to change us, to cause change in this church so we can stay on top of things for Jesus in our community. We see Acts in three parts. It's, it's kind of cool. They broke Acts into three different sections. But Jesus originally commanded the apostles to go and preach the gospel. Don't leave till I settle the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit settles on you, you go out and spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he told them, you go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. He gave them that order to go do that. And what's cool, uh, chapters 1 through 8 pretty much covered Jerusalem. Those disciples, those apostles spread the word through Jerusalem, which meant they were talking to 99.9% .9 Jew. That word, they thought, was for the Jew, God's chosen people. And then... We got into chapters 8, and we went through 9, 10, and we're almost done with 11. And it goes on into 12. It's for Judea and Samaria. And that really puts a spin on things because they are not God's so-called chosen people. They are Gentiles. They are Greek. They're like you and me. And it took some tuning up. Peter had to get tuned up. The, the Jewish uh, converts had to get tuned up because they thought since that word was spreading through Jerusalem that God's chosen people were the only ones that were allowed to hear the saving uh, love and mercy and grace of Jesus. And God says, no way, that is not true. And he gave Peter this vision and he used all the unclean animals and unclean meat as a description. And he lowered that down to heaven and gave Peter that vision and says, what I have made clean is clean. And Peter took away from that that it was okay to go to the unclean and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that started a revolution for you and me and every other Jew and Gentile to hear the word. And then soon we're going to see uh, in chapters 13 through 28 that it's the world. Peter's going to start out on a missionary journey and he's going to go every place that he can go with them walking their boat distance. And the world, so-called, at that time is going to hear the news of Jesus. Thousands have come to faith and been baptized and they've been discipled. Uh, there were thousands added daily. The word was so powerful going on at that time. And oh my gosh, I wish we could get our churches back to that today. Thousands and thousands still need saved daily. 
And if it happened then, it can happen now. And we know that foreign countries, that, that very thing is going on right now. But boy, is it hard for them because they're getting killed just about as fast. It has to all the underground hidden. And that should be something for you and me to really think about keeping our hearts that we're free to come to Kenneville, Indiana on Riley Street at an old, old grocery store and hear about Jesus with no problem. That is precious, and we need to never forget that. There's been a focus on the Jewish culture, but it's being broken. And it's still our first fight yet today in the church universal over who we can let in our churches. Oh my gosh, do we have to be careful. They don't believe in our doctrine. That's not the way it's done. We've never done it that way before, and bless God, we ain't doing it that way now. It's still our problem. We have that mindset that God's word is only for certain few, and it is not true. There are no barriers for the word of God. Jews are encouraged to expand their outreach outside of Israel. And uh, it wasn't their will, but it was God's. And we're going we're gonna to read in our scripture in just a minute that Stephen started that ball rolling and it cost him his life. But the Jews are going to expand their outreach outside of Israel. Churches are going to be planted in Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch because of it. And they're powerful. And I already said, Peter eats and stays with Simon Tanner, and he's confronted by the converted Jews. They determine in the end, after Peter explains why he went to that unclean house and ate that unclean food, it was because God gave him the vision, the okay, the command to do it. And they finally, in the end, determine, so then... God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. They came to see and know that God had ordered that saving love, mercy, and grace for those Gentiles. And they accepted it, and they backed off and let Peter go do what God had called him to do. So that brings us up uh, into our text today, and it's Acts 11, and we're going to start verse 19 and go through 30. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to, to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. A cool story. There's a lot packed in that scripture there. Um, it begins with Stephen. 
and, and the wording there says, Now to those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen. Stephen was one of the deacons. Uh, they got in kind of a little squabble or, or a, a, they brought up the fact that the, the orphans and the widows weren't being taken care of like they should be in the early church. And Peter and the apostles were so busy teaching and preaching that they weren't taking care of the physical needs of the body of Christ. So some people brought up, you know what? We need somebody to take care of those widows and orphans. It's God's command. So they appointed those first deacons, seven people, and Stephen was one of them. And Stephen is confronted by the Sanhedrin, and he was asking about all this preaching and teaching that was going on. Stephen was one of the deacons chosen to feed the widows and the orphans in the early church. And he was a good spokesman. He was a spiritual leader. He was a teacher. And he was a good debater. So any time that there was confrontation or anything, they would have Stephen go in there and sick him. Debate with him. Tell him about Jesus. Tell him why we're doing things. And Stephen would go do it. Well, Stephen uh, called them stiff-necked people. And when you start name calling your people, uh, there's going to be some reaction. Every action has a reaction, and that wasn't cool. He was calling these Jewish converted leaders stiff necked people, and it made them mad. You're like your fathers, he said. Your fathers were stiff necked, just like you. They wouldn't listen. And you resist the Holy Spirit, and you kill Jesus. Now that's kind of worse than John Hagee gets. I mean, he's standing there with a bunch of people that wiped out Jesus, and you think they care about Stephen? Uh-uh. And they stoned him. They put him to death over it. And while they stoned him to death, he looked up and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That guy was so dedicated, so faithful, so grounded in his faith that he, he knew where he was going. This had led him, this path had led him to the end of the road as we know it here on this earth. And he was saying, Jesus, I'm coming to see you. And I did it for you. Receive my spirit. And then what does he do? He sounds just like the Lord Jesus. He says, Lord do not hold this sin against me. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody was throwing rocks at me to the point of killing me, I don't know if I'd care about him. He did. He had been discipled. He had been trained by Jesus and knew what he was called to do. Knew his faith would carry him through. And he did it. And it cost him his life. And the death of Stephen scattered the Jewish converts, causing God's word to spread everywhere. It went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and to Antioch. And I want us all to know that when we get in a storm like that, when we get persecuted, what Satan means for bad, God will turn to good. They killed Stephen, and you know what happened? The church universal was birthed. They would have stayed in that little clump in Jerusalem and just the Jews would have heard about Jesus. And when they got persecuted, they scattered for their lives and everywhere they went, they were a light in a dark place and the churches were starting to be burned. These converts only evangelized the Jews, but some of them spoke to the Greeks. Some of them were out of their comfort zone and went to talk to the Greeks. On their way to a Jewish culture, they walk through a non-Jewish culture and they sat there and, and gave the word of Jesus to them. And they were converted. How powerful. And I was thinking, Samaria, that's where everybody walked around. And what does Jesus do? He walks right through it, talks to the woman at the well, and thousands are saved because of it. And Paul
what does he do? Send these apostles right into Samaria, to Judea and Samaria. So see, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you and me. And we need not to be afraid who we're talking to. God has called us all to be different. We've kind of done destiny, family of faith a little different as a church. And so far, God is blessing our, our efforts. We read uh, Michael Slaughter's book, Unlearning Church. He says, everything you know about church, unlearn it. And let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you. Don't be afraid to step out and do the undoable. Because all things are possible with Christ. It may cost you a heartache or a little bit of effort, but it'll be worth it. Trust me. And so far, he's been faithful. The Lord's hand was with them, Scripture says, and I love that when the Lord's hand's with me. I don't know about y'all, but man, is it good to have the Lord's hand with you. It's where our blessings come from. It's where everything revolves around us. I already mentioned the scripture about Colossians where all things were made by God and for God and it's in Him that it all holds together. So it's good to be in God's hand. His hand was upon them, scripture said. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you need the Lord's favor? Do you need God's hand on your life? We all do, don't we? Well, a good way for that to happen is to serve him. This Antioch church had a servant's heart and a servant's mind. They were thinking out of the box. They weren't worried about themselves and the persecution that was going on around them. They were worried about other souls and salvation. They declared he was Lord. And I was thinking about the scripture that's so cool that Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. This church in Antioch was confessing Jesus as Lord. These apostles were confessing him. Do you confess him as Lord? When you're at Walmart, when you're at Scott's, no matter where you go, are you confessing Jesus as Lord? Never, never, never be afraid <coughs> To hide your faith. I want to tell you there are religions and faiths all over this land that are pushing us our Christian belief in the ground. And it's our fault. Because we're not standing up for what we believe in. Be bold. Be strong with your faith. It can happen no matter where it needs to happen. Don't worry about your workplace firing you. If they do... God will raise you up to a better job. Right. There's a better one waiting on you. He's a God of increase. He moves you out to move you up. And Jay Sekulow would love to jump on that baby so we, we can get you steered and we'll get your job back. I don't know why you'd want it back, but we can get it back. <laughs> Show others what he's done for you. Every one of us in this room have a testimony about what Jesus has done for us. Show people. Be light in a dark place. There are so many lonely people, so many hurting people that need Jesus. And you be his hands, his feet, and his eyes. Show others what he's done for you. I wrote down, it causes people to change. We, uh, we had a really neat uh, Bible study at Thursday night. We're going through 1 Peter. And it was talking about change. And if you want things to change, you have to change your mind. You have to change the way you think. There are so many people walking around with their cup half full or half empty. Uh, that thing's half full. It's the way you talk, the way you speak. Change your mind. Renew your mind, Scripture says daily. We have to change the way we think. It causes people to change. They turn to the Lord and change their worldly minds. We have a mind that's full of worldly things going on around us. 
we're just consumed by worldly things because we're, we're living in the world and, and just moving at a fast pace. But it changed their worldly minds. Uh, our, our Bible study is a battle for holiness. And if you want to be holy, you have to, to train your mind to think holy and to be holy. So uh, we, we've got a really neat Bible study going on Thursday. Uh, come and visit us. A powerful church was birthed in Antioch. And they needed a shepherd. And I can relate to that so strongly. I was thinking about how the early church were having people saved so fast that there were more, more people to form a church than there were people to disciple them. And today we've gotten in a place in our world, and I'm not saying it's right, but God gave me a definite call to plant Destiny Family of Faith. I became a shepherd before there was even a flock. And here the flock was there and needed a shepherd. And they sent the word back to Jerusalem that there's an awesome church in Antioch going on and we need somebody to disciple us and lead us. They needed a shepherd. And uh, when the word got back to Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas. Barnabas was ready to go. Barnabas heads out to Antioch and he finds an on-fire church for Jesus. Now, if any of you have ever led or taught, or it's cool to be talking to on fire people. It makes your job a whole lot easier. Uh, when you all go to sleep, it's kind of boring up here. And I, I take some of that responsibility. But it's, it's easy to work with people. There was an evidence of God's grace that said over that congregation. It's really neat to know that you're working with people that are on fire for Jesus. That there are people that God has given gifting to, and every one of you have your own special gifting to serve God with. And it's cool to be in a place to have an opportunity to use that gifting and be a part. To not only hear God's word, but to be able to put it hands on, to be able to do it. And I, I, I love it here at Destiny where we have so many places for people to fit in. He didn't find a perfect church. So those of you that are guests and visitors here, if you're looking for a perfect church, you're in the wrong place. Like Chuck Swindell says, uh, it might have been perfect, but when you walk in, it ain't perfect no more. <laughs> All of us are sinners saved by grace, aren't we? Yeah. We're not going to find perfect. The only time we're finding perfect is when Jesus calls us home. But we can do the best we know how to do. He didn't find a self-sufficient church. They knew they needed a leader. They knew they needed to be discipled. They needed the word of God. And they <laughs> sent for it. He finds a church in love with Jesus doing the best they know how to do, open to growing and being discipled. And that is an awesome church. When you're open to things, when your heart is open to new things, new ways, different technology, like I stand up here and watching you all, especially John Wicker with his, his iPhone in his hand, and he's not texting, he's got his Bible on there. How cool is that? Technology. It's still God's word, but it's a different way of doing things. We're open to that. And that's a cool thing. Open to growing and being disciples is important. He finds a church that wants to be Christ followers. And they call them Christians. The first time anybody has ever been called a Christian in the word of God. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't look it up, but I think there are only two other places in all the NIV that the word Christian is used in Scripture. Christ followers. And we studied that Bible college that the word Christian was developed by the, the atheists and the, the people that hated Jesus and, and God. It was to call you a Christian. 
if you were labeled as a Christian, man, you were nothing, no good. And what God meant for bad again, he turned to good. We're Christians, Christ followers, are we not? We need to be following Christ or we're following the wrong thing. There is only one way, Jesus says. He says, I am the way. He finds a church that wants to be Christ followers and they call them Christians. Uh, Christians are Christ ones. That's how that word originally started was the word Christ and then ones. So they were the people that were following Jesus. They were different uh, races. These people had come from all over. They were Jews and Gentiles alike, and they had come from everywhere. So they didn't have a common place that they lived when they came together. They were different cultures. These people, some of them, lived and, and breathed Old Testament scripture. They knew Jewish laws, 613 of them. And they pulled their prayer shawl over them and they started the corner and prayed 613 chords until they got back where they started. They knew all that. And others lived like heathens. They didn't know anything about God. They had different languages. And we saw that when the Holy Spirit settled over that group, they started speaking in tongues. And it was so they could all hear the Word of God in their own language. Pretty cool. No one was left out. And they had different lifestyles. Every one of those people lived different lifestyles. Those Greeks, they didn't stop three to five times a day and pray. They went on about their business and run on luck. Different lifestyles, different strokes for different folks, and they're all brought into unity. They had Jesus. Every one of these people at Antioch had Jesus in their heart, and it showed. And when, when Barnabas walked in there, he could see it. And I want us, if we take nothing else away from here today, I want us to know that we are watched and we have to show people Jesus. People are paying attention to us more closely than they are people that don't believe. They want to know if we're going to mess up. And then there are people in here this morning that I want you to know that Jesus knows no stranger. He created everybody in his image, so there's a part of him in everybody there's a part of every person that's ever walked this world that connects to Jesus. He has no stranger. He has no boundaries. He walked right through wherever he wanted to go. And if he couldn't get there by land, he walked across the water. No problem. No boundaries. There are no limits with our Jesus that we love and honor and praise. No limits. He understands all languages. I think it's so cool. Sonic can pray in her home language and the Lord hears her loud and clear. And I can speak my gibberish and use ain't and he understands every word I say. He can bring all in unity to one faith. He has the power, the ability to do that. And that's his goal, is for you and I to be of one heart and one mind, one faith. And that originally was called the Catholic faith, one universal faith. And then the Romans got a hold of it and messed it all up and turned it into Roman Catholicism. But the original church was called the Catholic Church. God sends Barnabas, a good man, a wonderful example. And now I want to talk to the leaders here, the people that are in ministry. Good people. Good man. He was a good man. Full of the Holy Spirit. When we get leaders and people that come in here and want to serve in a big way, that's the first thing I look at is are they spiritual? And I came from a couple different churches that looked at people that had successful businesses 
as successful people for the church. Just because you can run a good business doesn't mean you can run God's business. You have to be spiritual. And I watch for spiritual people as they come in here. Full of faith, it says Barnabas was. Full of faith. All of us need to be full of faith. I'm telling you, there are days we go through some really, really tough situations. Uh, John Wicker's family experienced a, a, a terrible crash that killed the gal and the child. And they've had family death for the last couple months. Severe. And John said it was like a celebration at the funeral. They had faith. They had Jesus. And it got them through that's what it takes, is to be full of faith, no matter what. With an evangelistic heart, he went, Barnabas went to Antioch to watch these people come to faith and grow and continue to serve and be more powerful for the Lord. And I love it here at Destiny. We have outreach, uh, an evangelistic heart. It's cool. That's what Roger Thon's uh, uh, position is here at the church. He's an outreach pastor. He's linking the community, different areas in, in outreach back to this church so we can show him Jesus. He's already out there at the nursing home, I told you a week or two ago, he had a 87-year-old guy get saved. Now he's got the dishwasher hook. <laughs> yeah. So Roger, I got to confess something to you. I stole the Bible. I just said, you didn't steal the Bible. They're free. And she read a book that Roger gives them. And what's the name of it? Jesus Calling. I said, I read that. It changed my life forever. It can even affect the dishwasher. She's not even out there where Roger is. Outreach. Taken evangelism outside these walls, a powerhouse with the kids. There's just all kinds of things going on here. The church has growing pains. And I can relate to that really strong right now because we are having growing pains. There's so much going on here constantly. And we need good, faithful, spirit-filled leaders to help us keep everything moving and growing. Growing pains are a good thing, but boy, they can really be detrimental to the church. And Barnabas is not self-centered. He's not wanting all the glory for himself. He knows I need help. And I experienced it here when God sent Mark and Jenny and Martin Q. Oh, he was a breath of fresh air. Spirit-filled, faithful. They wanted to serve God. And he's helping me pick the slack up here in Jenny. He's helping Karen with things. And we're just trying to make this thing start to gel and get stronger. We can't go to sleep. We have to keep working and striving to go to the next level with leadership and relationship. And that's why I'm so excited about these small groups and the different things, the men's breakfast going on. The church has growing pains. Barnabas can't do it alone. He's encouraged and taught, but he needs help. And he's looking for Saul, which we know later is going to become Paul. We've got many new believers here at Destiny that need help, need men, or need disciples. So I want you to pay attention and listen. And if you're a new, so-called new person here at Destiny, if you want a friend, you need to be a friend, too. Don't put all the responsibility on us to come and seek you out and shake your hand and remember your name. I want you to make people know who you are. Reach your hand out and, and make yourself known. We're a loving church here. We take pride in, in loving people. So don't be afraid. Uh, shake, a, shake a hand and learn who they are and let them know who you are. Barnabas sets out to find Saul. And all of us need help and should be mentoring somebody as well. And I'm going to talk to you leaders again. 
Don't do anything to inherit destiny, family, and faith unless you're pulling somebody along beside you to mentor and raise up to take your place. God will give you a new job. Don't worry about having nothing to do. Mentor somebody. So if you've got to go to the Philippines and get a couple kids and bring them home, your job's covered. We see a pattern here starting to set up. If we pay attention to it, uh, Barnabas goes and gets Paul. And we're going to see a pattern set up where they went two by two. And I, I know why that happens, and I love it, where two or three are gathered in my name. I'm in the midst of thee. So when you have somebody helping you teach a, 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 the third and fourth graders, you got somebody there with you, and the Spirit and God's really flowing. And what one of you can't think of, the other one will. Two by two, Barnabas goes to get Saul so they can disciple this hungry group at Antioch. What a cool thing. Many were taught, it says, they became disciples. It says great numbers were taught. And our churches have very few disciples today. And I'm going to talk to you like John Hagee for a second. They either know it all, or they don't care, or they're too busy to be discipled. I don't know where you all fit in that, but you fit in it somewhere. It sounds harsh, but it's true. We're sleeping like the disciples with Jesus. And they went up the mountain with him, and, and Jesus says, stay awake and pray with me for an hour. And he turned around and looked, and they were sleeping. The church worldwide today is asleep. They're not being discipled. They're showing up for church whenever they feel like it. And we've got lukewarm churches starting to set up like it talks about in Revelation. And what happens to that lukewarm church? Gets spit out of God's mouth, doesn't it? God help us to never become lukewarm here at Destiny. We have to want to grow and know Jesus more than we do right now. It's imperative that we do that. No matter the excuse, it's a problem. It's a problem for the church universal. We need to be strong and bold. We hear about our Islam fates and, and these radicals are taking everything over. They don't have to. Our president jumped right on board and showed up at the meeting with all the rest of the nations, didn't he? No. No. Come on. Where are we at in all this? We need to get serious about this faith, this Christ walk. Our time is short. It's like Joyce says, only God knows. But our time, the patterns are setting up to where we are getting short on time. We'll be, be found ready. We're called Christians. And to be called a Christian wasn't cool back then. And now we've got most of the United States of America say they're Christian. Even though our president says we're not a Christian nation, just ask somebody if they're Christian. They'll say, sure, man. Recent Gallup poll talked to people all across the United States. 77% of Americans identify themselves as a Christian. Over three-fourths of the people walking this soil say they are Christian. Think about that. 5% are other religions. So we've got like Sana here that, that believes in Islam. And the other, the other faiths that are walking around the United States of America, 5% of the people have other faiths like that. 24% of our population claim to be Catholic. Now, it depends on who you talk to about being Catholicism. Uh, some of them say they're Christian and others say they're not. But 24% of the United States of America are Catholic. And 2% are Mormon. I thought that was interesting. They separated Mormons from the, the rest of it. Less than 10% of the church disciples under a leader. 
Less than 10% of our churches in the United States are coming to a Bible study or a discipleship program. And I got to thinking about that. We run about 200 here uh, consistently. We've had uh, spurts up to 300 and, and down to 160. But for the most part, 200. 10% of that's 20. When we have a Bible study Thursday night, 2025. So we're falling right into the national, national average. And I don't know about y'all, that might sound cool to you, but it ain't good enough for me. We need to be more involved in discipleship. And if you're hungry for something, we'll get somebody to lead it and do it. Let us know. People have to be discipled. Jesus gave the command, go and make disciples. To make disciples, you have to have somebody to disciple. And I know so many people that walk in churches today all over this land and say, I'm telling you that place is dead. There ain't nothing going on there. The pastor don't tell me nothing. And they're just... Uh, 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 uh. And if they wanted to know and wanted to grow and wanted to learn, they could learn something. I don't care how dead the church is. There's a word for somebody somewhere. We need to be disciples. We need to be strong in our faith, and to do that, we have to be in God's Word. It's the only way. The way, the truth, and the life. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word, and if we don't know Jesus fully, we haven't been in the Word long enough. So we need to be disciples. We got plenty of room here, so y'all show up Thursday night and Karen can bake an extra pan of cookies for y'all. <laughs> we need to be strong in our faith. We need to have strong families. And that's why we want to get this men's breakfast going. I want 90% participation out of this church at that men's Bible study. I can't demand it, but I'm going to pray it in. Bless God. We need to have strong families to make the church strong. To make our communities, our culture strong. We have to man up and do what we're supposed to do. And we need strong families to do that. We need to be stable financially. Uh, Rob and Melissa and Pat and Michelle worked really hard to do the Dave Ramsey series and cause people to learn about finances. It has caused people in this church <coughs> to come to the faith of Christ and, and get healthy. How, how many how many dollars did we have in debt? Like 683000 $686,000, and there were 20 couples? Yeah. 20 couples. 15. Almost $700,000 worth of debt in 20 couples. That's not mortgage. That ain't your house on there. That's credit card and all the other stuff dead. Pretty severe. And I'm not picking on the people coming to class. I'm thankful they're coming because they're going to get rid of that. But that's how serious we are financially in the United States of America, our family. we got to get healthy financially. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And if we can get healthy and live like no one else so we can live like no one else... We've got money to give away for God's work right. and the need, and we're going to talk about it in a second because i got to hurry up. We need a mindset of reaching out in a time of trouble. Will we be a problem or a solution if we have a tragedy? They sent a prophet to tell them there's going to be a famine. And I thought it was so cool. The scripture says... The Roman world. They called it a world. And after we're through chapter 12, these apostles are going to go to that. That is the world. Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And that's where they're going to go. And what does God do? He allows a famine to happen in that world to see if his church is going to step up and take care of it. 
Now, they ain't got a direct landline to Obama yet. They've got to count on God and the church to handle this deal. And you know what? The United States of America, the world, needs to get back in that mindset. It ain't about Uncle Sam. It ain't about Obama. It's about the church universal helping his brothers and sisters get through a, tra a traumatic experience. He sends a famine. And you know what? They sent a gift, not expecting it back. A bunch of the people get to talking in the church and say, we've got brothers and sisters over there that are in severe need. Let's all get together and send them a gift and help them get through it. And they all, it says, according to their ability, the disciples each, according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. And then it goes on to say, this they did. They gave an offering and sent it to Judea to help their brothers and sisters get through a famine. And it fulfills the scripture that says the righteous will never be found begging for bread. Because we take care of our own. The church has got to get back to that. We've got to get off of welfare and all this malarkey and baloney and get back to the basics of Jesus Christ. It works. It always has and it always will. They send a gift, not expecting it back. Well, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, dude. And if you don't scratch mine first, I ain't scratching yours. No, that's not the way it works. We send help when help is needed. We planted the church on Isaiah 58. And it don't say if they come to church 15 times a year, then you can clothe them. You can feed them when they're hungry. You can give them a shelter when they're in need. It says no. When they're in need, you do it. And you let me judge if they're worthy or not. You supply the need. The church was spreading the gospel of Jesus. It was discipling the saints. Its leaders were responding to the needs. They were calling for help in time of trouble. They encouraged one another, covering the needs of their brothers and sisters. They were being Christians, Christ followers. That is what they were doing here in this story. It takes faith, it takes discipline, it takes courage, and it takes time. Are you willing to do that? I'm telling you, we're busy, busy, busy little bees. And the more gadgets we get that give us more time, the more busy we get. Our elders and pastors want to pray with you this morning. They're going to come up and pray with you. God only knows what you need or, or who you want to praise and lift up or, or whatever the need might be, but we're going to have them come up right now and pray with you. There's so much going on in this land. And brothers and sisters, we sat here this morning and probably most of us are thinking, oh, I'm really cool, man. I, I don't need prayer. You know, there are suddenlies and instantlies that come up in our lives that forever change our lives. We need to forever be thankful and grateful for what Jesus has done for us and through us. If you don't have anything going on in your life, in your life right now that's traumatic, then you ought to be up here thanking him. And if you've got something going on that you need prayer for, then you need to be up here asking him. What's said here stays here. And I'm telling you, you can walk in with one of the most heavy burdens on your heart that you've ever had, and you can leave here with the peace of God when you leave just because you lift it up in prayer. That's who we have to be. That's what the church has to be about, is restoration and discipling. Can we all do it together? We have to.
There's no other way. And I can't do it myself. I've got, I've got Mark down here and, and Roger and, and the elders are here. Steve and Rob and Melissa and Brian's our youth pastor and Carrie and, and Kyle. We can't do it ourselves. We need you to help us. And God has blessed each and every one of you with a gift. And you can fit in here somewhere. And you know what? If you say, I want to help somebody teach and learn how to do that, and it isn't for you, then you can come in at 8 o'clock in the morning and you can bake the cookies in the oven. There's something here for you to do. Everybody has a plan. And Jesus wants to touch you right where you're at. You're not too dirty. You're not too clean. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, if you're Islam, who you are, what you are. Jesus loves you right where you're at. He wants every nation, every tongue, every tribe, all mankind to come to know him. And you and I have a job to do. So I need you to jump on board and help us here at Destiny and grow. And love people like they've never been loved before. And we'll see a change in them. And people will want to know what happened to you, Susie Pierre. You are different. I need what you've got. Where did you get that? Don't tell them I got it at destiny. Tell them I got it from Jesus. But I can show you a man that will love you. And he wants every one of you. All he wants is for you to love him back and acknowledge his Lord and reach out your withered hand in the strength you have and he'll pick you up and take you to a next level you can't even imagine. Let's love him and be called to his purpose. And he'll turn all of the bad things to good. Uh, and his hand of favor will be over. Can I, can I share something that happened with the family? Mm-hmm. I have to share this. It's so important. for. I just can't share this with one set. I have to share it with the whole congregation. I was so convicted to go to this funeral in South Carolina. And they actually tried to find my way out of it. Went to this funeral, and a 34 year old fought in Iraq, had a huge drinking problem, all the world troubles he carried. Okay. My cousin had lost her, her 26 year old daughter three years ago to the day that she was killed in car wreck, the brain cancer. Had lost her son in a shooting last year, and her husband in a shooting. 